Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you covered by Social Security? Then please listen carefully. Public opinion polls by the Equitable Life Assurance Society show that millions of Americans know little or nothing about their Social Security. Yes, according to these Equitable Society surveys, you may be failing to safeguard rights worth thousands of dollars. Therefore, as a public service, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will devote this program's entire middle commercial, you in just 14 minutes, to information on Social Security. Information that may mean money in your pocket. Tonight's FBI file, The Unwilling Partner. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, today made available the latest figures on America's current crime wave. This study contains the newest facts known to your FBI about the substance and the quantity of crimes committed in the United States in the past 12 months. The truly shocking news about the war against crime is that instead of progress, it must be reported more persons were arrested in the past year than in any other year on record. The arrests of men increased 14%, and the arrests of women rose almost 10%. Nowhere in the land is there a community which does not know crime. And in very few places is any ground being gained in the constant battle against our army of criminals. A battle which must be won and won soon, unless we wish to leave the generations which follow a heritage of lawlessness. Tonight's file opens at the spring training camp of a minor league baseball team in a Midwestern town. It is early afternoon, and scattered around the ballpark are several dozen players. Some of them are shagging flies in the outfield, some are having pepper practice, and a few of the pitchers, like Red Martin, are warming up with a catcher. Take it easy, Red. Still three weeks to opening day. I know. I just felt like cutting loose. You don't have to prove anything. Just get in shape, and you'll work the opener. Okay. <laughs> Quit in a little while. Take a shower. Thanks. Just a couple more, huh, Charlie? Mm. Hello, Red. Hi, son. Can I have your autograph in this ball, Red? Sure, kid. As soon as I finish working. Well, you know something? We just made up a Red Martin club. Did you? Yeah. We're going to come out and see you every time you pick. How many of you in the club? Four of us so far. I'm the president. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you some passes for the opening game, huh? Honest? Oh, sure. What's your name? Herbie Jackson. 
Okay, Herbie. They'll be at the pass gate. Gee, thanks, Red. Forget it. Okay, Charlie, that's all for me. Okay. See you later, Herbie. I'm going to take a shower. Okay. Hey, Red. Huh? Red, I want to see you a minute. Uh, don't you remember me? Vince Green. Oh, yeah. You were a friend of Joe Jenkins. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Met you in St. Louis. Uh-huh. Been a lot of places since then. What are you doing here? I came to see you. About what? Business proposition, Red. I got a business, Vince. I'm a ball player. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You ain't gonna be a ball player all your life. This is a chance for you to hook into something nice. I'm busy, Vince. I gotta get in and take a shower before I cool off. Well, look, why don't you meet me after you get through with your shower? I'll wait for you outside the clubhouse, huh? At the ballpark. Until 7 o'clock? Yeah. Red, you knew I was going to have dinner ready early. Honey, I'm sorry. I met some guy who wanted to talk to me. That's why I'm late. Oh. Well, who was he? A guy named Vince Green. Do I know him? No. He was a friend of Joe Jenkins. I met him when I used to room with Joe. Oh. Whenever the ball club got to Joe's hometown, and this guy used to throw a party for us. Mm-hmm. Well, what's he doing here? Now he wants to go in business with me. What kind of a business? Used car lot, using my name on it. What do you put up? Nothing. What do you get out of it? Well, he wants to give me 25% of the business. Huh. Well, that sounds wonderful, honey. I told him I wasn't interested. What? I turned the deal down. Are you out of your mind? I don't like it. Well, why not? Helen, why should he cut me in like that? Because you're a big name in this town, that's why. This is a good move on his part. And it would be a good move for you. I don't know, honey. Well, I do. You call him up right now and tell him you've thought it over and you want to take up his proposition. But, Helen... Look, do you think I want to go on for the rest of my life worrying about whether you'll get a sore arm or whether some kid is going to get a lucky base hit off you and win a ball game? This way, you're in business. If your arm goes bad, the business keeps going. Don't you understand? Okay, I'll call him after dinner. I'm here in the shack, Vince. Oh. <laughs> Sign looks good. Yeah. Any sales today? Three sedans and a convertible. Mm-hmm. Not bad. We're open a week and that makes 38 customers. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, that Red Martin's name really hustles business. I told you it would. We only got six cars left. I'm going to call Pete. Tell him to send down another shipment. Okay. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, Red was in here this morning. What do you want? Well, he just wanted to see how things were going. He asked me where we got all the cars. What'd you tell him? They said we had contacts back east that bought the cars for us and shipped here. Good. We'll pull out if he ever knows those cars are hot. Well, what would his beef be? Well, the poor sucker happens to be honest. Yeah, but he gets 25% of all this. For nothing. For your information, he only gets 25% of the profit. Well, even that runs into a real good chunk. George... With me keeping the books, there is no profit. In a nearby city, a combination warehouse and garage is on fire. It is a three-alarm blaze. FBI Special Agent Taylor is standing just inside the fire line. Jim. Oh, Jim. Oh, hello, Randy. Sorry I had to call you at this hour of the night. That's all right. I've just been watching a lot of evidence being burned up in there. Evidence on what? You know that list of stolen cars we were working on down at the office? Uh-huh. Well, when this fire broke out, the fireman went into this garage and discovered a secret wall in the back. That's where the fire started. I see. Part of the wall worked on an electric switch. You pressed a certain button, that part of the wall swung out, and you could drive a car through. Into a concealed part of the garage? That's it. That's where they used to fix up the stolen cars and paint them. Matter of fact, it was the paint that made this blaze spread so fast. How'd you find all that out, Jim? Well, when the firemen first discovered the secret wall, they found a car back there and drove it out. That's it, parked down there, down the street. Uh, the gray convertible? Yeah, that's right. I guess the gang didn't have time to change the motor number on it because it hadn't been filed off as yet. Uh, 
And it's one of the cars on our list? That's right. Has anybody been caught, Jim? Any of the people from the garage, I mean? Yeah, the night manager is down at headquarters now. And there was a body found, but so far it's been unidentified. I see. You know, Randy, this could be the break we've been looking for in this used car ring. I know. Well, we'll know more as soon as we can examine this place. How soon do you think that'll be? About an hour from what the fire chief told me. Randy, look, why don't you stay here and go through the place as soon as you can, huh? All right. You going back to the office? No, I'm going down to headquarters and see that night manager. Find out how much he knows. You home, Red? In the living room. Well, I, I didn't see any lights on. Well, why are you sitting here in the dark? I've been thinking. Well, suppose you try thinking with the lights on. Okay. What's the matter with you? When I got home here this afternoon, there was a letter for me. Who from? Joe Jenkins. Well, what do you want? I wrote to him about this new partner of mine, Vince Green. Well? well? Joe says in his letter that Green is no good. But he once tried to get Joe to throw a ball game for him so he could win a bet. Joe never reported it because he couldn't prove it. Oh, well, honey, that that might be just a story. You know the way Joe used to make up things. Oh, it ain't a story. Joe also says he checked on Green after that. Found he was mixed up in a lot of rackets. Oh. I told you I never liked this deal, Helen. Right from the very beginning. Now I'm going to get out of it. Red, wait. Find more out about him first. Oh, I know enough right now. But what about the money you're making? Helen, for all we know, those cars may even be stolen. I don't want that kind of money. But, Red... I'm going down to see Green and call off this whole deal. Well, Jim, that fire finally cooled down enough for us to explore the ruins. Did you get anything, Randy? Yes, I found evidence that an outfit called the A&B Trucking Company has hauled a shipment of automobiles for them. Well, they're a legitimate outfit, aren't they? I know. I called them to see where they'd ship the cars. They're checking it. We should hear from them any minute now. Oh, fine. Uh, what did you get from that night manager? Plenty. He told me there were three accomplices. Police picked them all up, questioned them. They all claimed they'd never seen the man who ran the business. Who gave them their orders? A man named Tom Chase. At least he paid them. He was the only one who dealt directly with the boss. It seems this boss traveled around quite a bit, setting up used car lots in different cities. Did you find out where to pick this Tom Chase up? He was the unidentified body in the garage. Oh, fine. The only one who can lead us... Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Oh, yes. Yes, just a moment, please, while I copy that down. Okay, go ahead. 4418. Main Street. Bay City. Got it. Yes, thanks very much. Bye. That was the A&B Trucking Company, Randy. Is that the address they shipped those cars to? Yes. I think the best thing to do is call the Bay City Police. This might tie in with something they're working on. George, I got some bad news. What? The garage burned down last night. But the whole thing? Yeah, yeah. Tommy burned to death and the others got nailed by the cops. Hey, that ain't good. This could be real trouble, especially if anybody talks. Well, they don't know much. They know enough to make it hot. What are we going to do? Hello? What, what, what? what? Leave this? This is a coal mine. There'll be others. How many cars we got left? Two? Close our bank account this afternoon. Get all our dough right here in my kick. Good. Now, look, as soon as we get organized... We'll... Who's that? Hello, fellas. Hi, you Red. What brings you around? I had to see you right away. Well, what about I got a letter from Joe Jenkins this afternoon. Oh. How is Joe? He told me some things about you. Things I didn't like. What is this? He said you tried to get him to throw a ball game once, Vince. But you're a racket guy. Joe said that about me? Yeah. I don't want to be mixed up with anyone like that. You want to quit, is that it? Yeah. Okay. We quit. You mean it? Sure, I mean it. All right. How many cars have you sold here so far? Oh, I don't know. How many, George? Forty-six. Why? I want the names of the people who bought them. 
What for? I want to call them. Check the motor numbers on their cars. So what's the idea then? I want to make sure that none of those cars were stolen. Wait a minute. Let me have those names. We ain't got them. What? Well, we lost them. Don't give me that. Look, Red, my advice to you is to forget all about this. Oh, no. I've got a reputation in this town. Oh. Him and his reputation. You think we didn't have one ourselves? <laughs> Turn in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI provides national security. Now a word about social security. Mr. Williams, I understand you have a question. Oh, yes, Mr. Keating, I have. When I get to be 65 and start collecting social security benefits, can I take a part-time job? I'd be pretty well fixed if I could do that. But probably not, Mr. Williams. If you worked in covered employment and earned more than $14.99 per month, you wouldn't get anything from Social Security. Before you make any further plans, get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. Ask him about the Equitable Society's three-step service on Social Security. The first step is full information. The answers to how Social Security applies to you personally. I see. Well, what's the second step? An immediate checkup on your position under Social Security to make sure all the money you've paid in is properly credited to your account. Your Equitable Society representative will supply you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration and will show you what to do with it. This checkup makes possible the last step in this service offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Well, what is that? After you've found out where you stand in Social Security, your Equitable Society representative will show you how a comparatively modest investment in life insurance will build Social Security into full security. He'll show you how life insurance and Social Security, working as a team, can give you and your family a future free from money worries. There's no charge for this service, no obligation whatsoever. So see your Equitable Society representative immediately or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Now back to the FBI file, The Unwilling Partner. You rarely see an item in your newspaper or hear a story on a radio newscast about a stolen automobile. Because the value of any single car is not likely to be large enough to make it newsworthy. However, it is newsworthy when you learn that many of those cars which are stolen all over the nation find their way into a pool which filters them to various exchanges throughout the country where they are altered in every respect and then resold. Those exchanges are big business today when the supply of automobiles is still seriously short of the demand. To give you some idea of how big those centers are, it is necessary only to tell you that in the last year, more than $61 million worth of cars have been stolen. That is more than $5 million worth every month. And the truly solemn fact about those figures is that they are increasing. <laughs> Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Randy, I've just come in to see the boss. About this used car ring? Yes, I told him what had happened so far, and he agreed that we might be getting pretty close to the core of it. He said that we were to work on this case exclusively for the next few days. Well, that's fine. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, yes, Chief. You have? Mm hmm. Closed out, huh? Yeah, I remember him. Oh, I see. All right, thanks, Chief. We... Yes. Yes, we will. Yeah. Why? That was the chief of police down at Bay City, Randy. Did he check that used car lot already? Yes, it was being run by three men. One of them, who seemed to be the boss, was Vince Green. Well, I know Green, Jim. He could be the boss of that whole operation. Yeah. The second one was uh, George Damon, and the third man was the one in whose name the lot was operated. 
Red Martin, a ball player. Red Martin? Mm Mm-hmm. I saw him pitch a two-hitter a couple of years ago, Jim. I met him after the game. Oh. He didn't seem to be that kind who'd get mixed up in this sort of racket. Huh? Well, the lot was deserted when the chief checked. There were no cars there, and everybody had vanished. Did he know where they all lived? Yes, Green and Damon lived at a hotel. They'd already checked out. Green had also withdrawn all his money from the Bay City Bank. How about Red Martin? Well, his wife claims that she hadn't seen him since early evening. Randy, I think we ought to get down to Bay City right away. This is pretty good heat. Glad we didn't sell it. You know, it would have been funny if we had to go out and buy a car from some legit. Times ain't never going to get that tough. Ever taken this highway before? Uh... Not that I know of, why? Whenever I ride on it, it makes me feel kind of funny. What for? Remember Chick Patterson? Yeah. He's part of it. I don't get it. Chick got in trouble when they were building this thing. North Side Mob took him for a ride, put him in one of those road mixes. Oh. Tell me about the new garage. I bought it about a year ago. I had a lot of cash and looked like good investment. Is it laid out good for you? Yeah. We can set up a phony wall just like any other place. Swell. Hey, Chick Patterson is getting kind of bumpy. Oh, Jim, uh, Mm -hmm. Mrs. Red Martin is outside. Oh, fine, Randy. Ask her to come in, will you? Sure. Uh, Please come in. Thank you. This is Special Agent Taylor, Mrs. Martin. Well, how do you do, Mr. Taylor? Hello, Mrs. Martin. Won't you sit down, please? Thank you. Uh, Jim, I'm going in to talk with the chief of police. Right, Randy. See you later. Mr. Taylor, have you heard anything about my husband? No, not yet. We've got an alarm out on his car, and that's about all we can do at the moment. You're sure you have no idea where he is? No. No, but I- I'm certain he's not hiding from the police. He's looking for those two men. Well, Mr. Martin, tell me, what made him go into a deal like this in the first place? Well, I, I'm i afraid I, I made him do it. Hmm. I, I wanted things he couldn't afford to buy me anymore. And so this chance to get some money, so, so I made him take it. I see. You said over the telephone before that he decided last night that he didn't want to be in business with them any longer. Yes, yes, that's right, Mr. Taylor. He got a letter from a man who used to be his roommate... The letter said that Vince Green was a crook. And your husband told you that he was going down to the used car lot and break up the partnership. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mr. Taylor, Red is an honest man. Oh, he he may not be young anymore and he may not be able to pitch as good, but but he's still dead honest. Mrs. Martin, he didn't phone you or get in touch with you in any way after he left the house, did he? No, no, he didn't. Uh, Pardon me, Jim, but we may have a break. About my husband? What is it, Randy? A youngster, one of the city schools, went to his teacher and told her that he saw Red Martin last night at the used car lot. I told you he went there. Where's the youngster now? He's on his way over here. Oh, good. Well, Mrs. Martin. Yes? You may go home now, and as soon as we have anything, we'll call you. That youngster's here, Jim. You want to see him now? Yes, Randy, please. Jim, this is Herbie Jackson. Hello, Herbie. My name is Jim Taylor. Hello, Mr. Taylor. Herbie, I understand that you uh, saw Mr. Martin last night. Yeah. I'm president of the Red Martin Band Club. Oh. And I went over to get his autograph for a new member. I see. Uh, what time was that, Herbie? It was right after my dinner. About half past eight. I see. And he was there when you got to the lot? Yes, sir. He was on the floor hurt. What? He was hurt bad. How do you know that, Herbie? His head was bleeding. Was he conscious? Oh, yes. He spoke to me. What did he say, Herbie? He told me he got beaten up by his partner. Did he tell you where he was going? Yes. He was going after his partners. He wanted to catch them. And he said he knew where they went. Well, did he mention any city to you? No, sir, he didn't. You sure? No, sir. I know he didn't. I'd remember if he did. Well, tell me, Herbie, did he say anything else to you? Yes. He said for me not to worry. 
But he wouldn't get me any trouble. I wonder why he was so sure of that. He said because he had a lot of relatives at one place he was going. A lot of his relatives? Yes, sir. He said it was always a cousin town for him. Uh, Jim, let's get hold of Mrs. Martin and see where his cousins live. I don't think we have to do that, Randy. Let's call the office of the ball club. I think they'll be more help. Vince, this is a real good layout. Yeah. We got room for two paint shops here. We can turn out a car every day. I talked to some boys in the east this morning. Oh? They said if we pay cash, we can have as many hots as we want. How much cash? Yard and a half a car. Delivered? Yeah. Well, that ain't bad. Oh, no, it should be a big help. Huh? huh? That should give you enough to open up another lot. Ah. Look who's here. Honest Red. That's right. What are you doing here? What do you think? How'd you know we were here? You got a call last night at the shack, just after I came, too. It was one of your stooges. He said he was expecting you up here to a garage. Took me a little time to find the right one. <laughs> You're a sucker for punishment, ain't you? What do you mean? Coming back for another treatment? I came to get the money you stole from my friend. That ain't what you're gonna get. George, let's continue this in the back room, huh? We'll talk right here. I got a gun here, chum. Let's do it our way. Oh, let's do it our uh, way. Huh? Drop that gun. Go on. Yeah, Jim. Come on, you two. I'm Who are you? Oh, now, wait a minute. Agent, the FBI. Yeah, yeah. You better get home and get some rest, Red. Old town will be out to see you pitch that opening game. Everybody except those two. I got a hunch they're gonna be tied up elsewhere. <laughs> Vince Green and George Damon were tried, convicted, and sentenced to 20 years imprisonment for a violation of the National Motor Vehicle Theft Act. The word cousins is a baseball expression meaning an opponent who is easy to defeat. And a check at the baseball team's office showed which club had never beaten Red Martin. On the same phone call, Special Agent Taylor learned the name of the hotel at which the ball club stopped when they visited that city. It proved a simple matter to learn that Martin had checked in at the hotel and to trail him until he led the two agents to the men who had attacked him. Men who were engaged in operating a stolen car ring and a string of used car locks. The fact that these men were thieves and in the used car business is not a reflection on this business as a whole. The overwhelming majority of used car dealers are capable, honest businessmen. The only important thing for you, the law-abiding citizen, to remember is to check on every stranger with whom you do business. In that way, you protect yourself and you do your part in fighting America's incessant battle, the war against crime. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now a quick review of the special three-point Social Security service offered by your Equitable Society representative. First, he gives you a clear picture of what Social Security can accomplish for you. Second, your Equitable Society representative supplies you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration for checking up on your position. Third, he shows you how easy it is to build Social Security into full security. Take advantage of the special service offered without charge by your equitable representative and the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, in addition to presenting another dramatic case, you will hear J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, with a message of importance to all of you. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society 
will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Runaway Racketeers on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Later on in tonight's program, it will be our pleasure to present Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, speaking to you from Washington, D.C. Are you covered by Social Security? Then would it surprise you to know that your rights under Social Security can be equivalent to twelve, fifteen, even eighteen thousand dollars, depending on your age, salary, and family situation? Rights worth that much are worth knowing about, worth safeguarding. Therefore, as a public service, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will devote this program's entire middle commercial, due in just fourteen minutes, to information on Social Security. Information which may mean money in your pocket. Tonight's FBI file, The Runaway Racketeers. many serious problems facing every law enforcement agency today, but perhaps the most important one is juvenile delinquency, because unless that problem is at least partially solved, there is no hope that the crime wave will recede. If the juvenile delinquency problem is attacked intelligently, then the constant flow of recruits to the army of criminals will be impeded, and then progress can be made in stifling the activities of our adult criminals. Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, will speak to you later in the program about this matter of vital concern to every one of you, whether you are a parent or not. It has been a mistake made by many people in the past that juvenile delinquency was no concern of theirs if they themselves did not have children whose lives they might guide. Nothing could be further from the truth. The problem that confronts your FBI and every other law enforcement agency in the nation also concerns you. Tonight's file opens late one afternoon on the edge of a river which flows through a large eastern city. A boy is walking along a dock that juts into the stream. He nears a group of youngsters who are swimming below. Hey, Vinny! Oh, hi, Rico! Hey, swim over the ladder, will you? Ah, come on up. I want to talk to you. What do you want? Well, I ain't going to yell down there. Come on up. Okay. What's in your mind, Rico? Hey, come on over here. Okay. Hey, throw me Eddie's shirt, will you? I want to wipe off. Okay. You got another butt? Mm, sure. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Where'd you get a full pack? I bought it. And that ain't all I can buy. With what? With this. Hey, how much you got there? Twenty-five bucks, and it's mine. Where'd you get it? Yeah, me and Charlie did a job. What'd you do, roll a drunk? Nah. A little stick-up? I figured out something that's better than a stick-up. Now I can't work it no more. Why not? Eh, yeah, Charlie got sick. What's the matter with him? I don't know. He's in a hospital. That's what I want to talk to you. Why? I want to work the same thing over again. I need another guy. You want to work with me? Yeah. What kind of a job is it? First you tell me if you're in or not, huh? Do I get that kind of dough? Hmm, maybe more. Charlie gonna be sore at me? I told you, it's my idea. I'll take care of it, Charlie. Okay, I'm in. Swell. Get your clothes and let's get back to the club. Right now? Yeah. We gotta find a doctor to call. What's the matter? You sick too? No, I ain't sick. That's part of the job. 
first thing we got to do is call a doctor. Rico, what is it? Shouldn't the doc be here by now? He'll show. Is this the place you and Charlie used? Nah, you think I'm that stupid? Well, I was just asking. You sure you gave the doctor the right address? It's just like you told me. Okay, okay. Now, look. When he rings the bell, you answer the door and look real sad. Okay. Let him in and remember, open the door real wide so we don't see me standing behind it. I will. And I'll take care of the rest. Hope it works. It worked the other day with Charlie and me, didn't it? Yeah. Then I'm... quit worrying as long as... Yeah, that's him now. Go ahead. Okay. Dr. Fulton? That's right, son. My mother's in that room there. Thank you. Okay, Vinny, let's roll him and get out of here. The next morning in the gymnasium of the local boys' club, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is visiting an old friend. Paul. Hey, Paul. Oh, hi there, Jim. Uh, right with you. Okay. Go ahead, keep grabbing, boy. Well, Jim, what are you doing in this neighborhood? Working. Uh-oh. Hope none of my boys are in trouble with the FBI. I hope not by myself, Paul. That's what I came here to check on, though. Oh? Yes, a doctor named Fulton paid a professional call to a flat around the corner last night and was knocked out by two youngsters. Yes? They robbed him after they knocked him out. Oh, Jim, I'm certain none of my boys would do a thing like that. Well, Paul, maybe you can help me find the two who did, huh? How much do you know so far? Well, early this morning, Dr. Fulton's wife called the police. I see. She said the doctor hadn't been home all night. His nurse reported that he'd made his last call last evening at an address in this neighborhood. The police checked and found him there. He wasn't dead, was he? No, but he'd received a very nasty skull wound. Uh -oh. He regained consciousness for a few minutes and told the police he'd been assaulted by two youngsters. Then he passed out again. Well, how does the FBI get into the case, Jim? Well, after the doctor was robbed, the youngsters took his car up to Playland Park. One of the tires went flat, so they abandoned it. Well, Playland Park, as you know, is just across the state line. Yes, I know. Well, what can I do to help, Jim? When Dr. Fulton comes to at the hospital, I'm going to get a full description of the boys, Paul. Then, if they're from this neighborhood, maybe you can tell me who they are. I'll certainly try. Fine. I'm going back up to the hospital now. I'll see you later. <laughs> Three to two, no nine. Who's with me, huh? Three to two, no nine. Come on, who's on a bed? Let's go. Let's go. Rico. Rick. Huh? Oh, hiya, Benny. You in the game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I see you for just a minute? Well, what about? Well, the rest of stuff from last night's job. Did you sell it? No, nah, not all of it. Why not? You don't look stupid. This is no place to talk business. But I thought you said Come on that... over here. I sold everything except this ring and a wristwatch. Couldn't you get nothing for him? I'm keeping the watch. You get the ring. Oh, let's have it, huh? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hey, it's got my initial on it. Hey, look, Vinny, I got to get back to the game, okay? Hey, wait, I forgot to tell you something. Well? I seen Pete Paxton today. He said hello to me. So what? Well, I guess the big guy's got the word how we've been operating. Maybe Pete could use us, huh? Look, if we keep going like this, Pete will be working for us. <laughs> Some joke. Ah, I mean it. When do we do another job, Rick? Come on, I... On who? I don't know yet. The phone book is full of doctors. Are you busy, Paul? Oh, come on in, Jim. Pull up a chair. Oh, thanks. I'm trying to lay out the strongest possible batting order for a game we're playing tomorrow. No? Need a good left-handed second baseman? <laughs> Need a whole infield. No. Oh, by the way, did you talk to the doctor? Yes. Yes, he couldn't give us much of a description on either one of the boys, but he guessed them to be around 16 years old. I see. However, he did give me a list of possessions which were taken from him and a description of each article. Here, Paul, take a look at this. Right. That list also contains the things that were stolen from another doctor who was assaulted last week. By the same boy? Well, we don't know that yet. Well, I guess the doctor couldn't give much of a description either. No, 
No, he couldn't. But because both assaults took place in this neighborhood, I was hoping maybe you'd spot some of the things on some of the boys who come in here. Well, Jim, we're, we're not getting many boys here these days. Kids want stuff to play with when they come here, and they've learned that we just don't have it. We got one pair of boxing gloves, for instance. What? Yes, and the baseball season is getting started, and we got one bat, two old baseballs, and both of them taped up. Well, I don't understand, Paul. How come you haven't got more equipment than that? Well, it takes money, Jim, and people aren't contributing it. They'll spend $50,000 to build a statue of a man on a horse, but they won't spend a dime for a kid on a sidewalk. Now, where do the kids go if they don't come here? Well, this time of the year, they go swimming off the docks down by the river. Mm. A couple of them get drowned every season, but they are poor kids, so no one cares except their families. That's about it. Paul, what can be done? A place like this ought to be a big help in fighting delinquency. Well, it can't be, Jim, unless we get kids to come in. If we had some equipment and a swimming pool, why, why I could break up half the gangs in the neighborhood. Are there many of them? Dozens. Mm-hmm. And every one of them has rented a cellar. Running their own clubs, you can imagine what they are. Mm, yeah. But I'm still trying, Jim. In fact, I'm going out this afternoon to make the rounds of the cellar clubs and talk to every boy I find and see if I can't get them to come here. Oh, Paul... If you spot any of the items on that list I gave you, let me know. Yeah, miss. Give me the chalk, Rico. Okay. Now, let's see... Seven ball cross side. Huh. Uh, nah, I didn't leave myself in no good position. Uh, let's see what I can do now. Hey, I forgot to tell you, I picked out a doctor for tonight. Who is he? A uh, guy over on Walton Avenue. Oh. Think I can make that combo? Hmm? Let's try it and see. Well, I wonder if... Hey, see who that is. Okay. Hello, Vinny. Oh, hello. Can I come in? Well, okay. Hello, Rocco. Hi. I came to see if I could get you boys to come over to the club and play on our ball team. That's for kids. Well, we're playing a team from the North End tomorrow, and we sure could use you. How much a man are you playing for? We don't play for money. Mm, We ain't interested. Hey, make a shot, will you, Vinny? Yeah, okay. Let's see now. I think I will try that combo... Penny. What? Where'd you get that ring? Huh? The ring you're wearing. Where'd you get it? Hey, sister bought it for him. Yeah, for, for my birthday. May I see it? What for? Well, I, I hate to say this, but it looks like a ring that was stolen from a doctor last night. Hey, you're crazy. I have a list here with a description of that ring, and I... Now, could... look, Mr. Crawford, yeah, I'll you got this, no... Vinny. You got any questions, Crawford? Ask him from me. Very well. Where'd you get that watch you're wearing? Huh? If I'm not mistaken, that's one of the stolen articles. Uh, this is my old man's watch. He lets me wear it. Sorry, but I don't believe either one of you. Now, look, I'm I... afraid I'm going to have to report you both to the police. Rico, what do we do? I'll show you. Oh. Rico, you shouldn't have done that. Well, he was going to the cops. What do we do now? Well, as long as he's out, let's roll him. <laughs> Return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI provides national security. Mr. Wilson, I believe you have a question. Yes, Mr. Keating. My wife is 35 years old. We've got three kids. Two, eight, and 11 years old. If I die, does she get Social Security benefits for the rest of her life? No. They stop after the youngest child reaches the age of 18 and are not resumed until your wife is 65 years old. As a matter of fact, if you want to get a clear picture of Social Security, why not get in touch with your Equitable Society representative? Full information is the first step in the Equitable Society's three-step service on Social Security. The second step is an immediate checkup on your position under Social Security. What's that for? To make sure all the money you've paid in is properly credited to your account. Your Equitable Society representative will supply you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration and we'll show you what to do with it. This checkup makes possible the last step in this service offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. What is that? After you've found out where you stand in Social Security, 
your equitable society representative will be able to show you how a comparatively modest investment in life insurance will build social security into full security. In other words, he'll give you an analysis to show how life insurance and social security working as a team can give you and your family a future of financial independence, of complete freedom from money worries. There's no charge for this service, no obligation whatsoever. See your Equitable Society representative immediately or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Runaway Racketeers. Tonight's case illustrates how a young boy who travels in bad company can become involved in a life of crime. It also shows that the commission of any later crime after the first one has been committed is almost a natural reflex. That is the reason why juvenile delinquency in any section is everyone's concern. Because from the youngsters who go wrong today will come the super criminals, the Dillingers, the Capones, the Carpuses of tomorrow. But that need not be their destiny. There are ways of fighting delinquency, and those ways are successful. They do take money, and they take people. But when a community proves that it is willing to provide boys' clubs and other clean places where youngsters can spend some hours of decent enjoyment, it has made headway. It takes two things. First, the financial ability to provide those places with equipment they need. Second, and more important... It takes long hours of hard work by people who must prove to the children that they understand their problems and are willing to help them solve those problems. That is the main ingredient in any recipe for fighting juvenile delinquency. That single, inexpensive quality, understanding. Tonight's file continues shortly after the attack on Paul Crawford. Rico and Vinny are walking along a neighborhood street. Rick, I still say you shouldn't have done that. Yeah, will you stop? We'll get in trouble on account of that. How are we going to get in trouble? Mm-hmm. Mr. Crawford knows where we live. Yeah, so what? Well, he'll have us arrested. He's got to find us first, don't he? Well, that's easy. All he does is go to my house and to your place. We ain't going to be there. Why not? Where are we going to be? I don't know yet, but we're blowing where are we going to go? I told you, I don't know yet. I don't want to run away, Rick. You want to wait for the cops? No, but... All right, then you better come along with me. But you don't know where you're going. We go to the bus station and we grab the first bus out. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Jim, this is Paul. Paul who? Paul Crawford. Oh, it doesn't sound like you, Paul. It doesn't feel like me either. I just came to. What do you mean? I found those kids for you, Jim, but they knocked me out. When did that happen? About an hour ago. Who are they? One of them is a kid named Rico Anderson. The other is Vinnie Franklin. How did you know they were the kids we were looking for? Franklin has the ring with a big letter F on it. The other one was wearing Dr. Fulton's wristwatch. Mm -hmm. You know where they live, Paul? Yes, Anderson boy lives at 58 West Adams Street. Oh, hold it, Paul. I want to write that down. All right. 58 West Adams. Okay, go ahead. And the other one lives at 118 West Jefferson. 118 West Jefferson. That's uh, Vinnie Franklin's address? Right. Got it. What did the doctor say about you, Paul? Oh, I haven't been to see a doctor, Jim. Got to this phone booth as soon as I came to. Well, you'd better get over to a doctor's office as soon as you can. I'll go to these two addresses and see if I can pick up the two youngsters. When I'm finished, I'll check with you down at the boys' club. Can I come in, Paul? Oh, yes, Jim. Oh, fellow, what'd the doctor say? I just have a new bump on my head, that's all. Oh, have you been to see those kids? Yes, I went by before I came down here. Neither one of them were home for dinner. Well, if they ran away, they can't get too far. 
I only had about a dollar and a half on them. Oh, I got pictures of each of them. Yeah. Take a look at these, will you, Paul? Mm, sure. Which ones are the good likenesses? I don't know. This one's a pretty good of Rico, Jim. Mm. I'd say, uh, yes. This is the best picture you've got of Vinny. That's well, thanks. What are you going to do with them? Well, my hunch is they've left town. I see. And if they did, maybe whoever sold them their tickets will remember where they went. I'm going to make the rounds of all the transportation terminals and show everybody these pictures. Mind if I come along? No, if you feel well enough, come on. Rico. Eh, what? When does this bus get to Boston? Eh, about another hour. Do you know anything about Boston? Sure. What? Well, uh, uh, they finished third last year. Huh? Third in the American League. Oh. What I meant was, do you know your way around? Have you ever been there before? No, but we'll make out. I still wish this bus was going the other way. Ah, what's the matter with you? This is big action. Not for me. What? As soon as we get off the bus, we'll head right for a hotel. You ever been in one? Just the downstairs part. Yeah, you ain't seen nothing. In the rooms, they got soft beds, stuff like that. Uh-huh. And when you get hungry, if you like, you can have your meals right in your room. That's... Sound like something to you, huh? Yeah, sleeping and eating. And I like it better at home. Now, you ain't going home till we make a few scores. There's plenty of doctors in Boston. When we clip them, then we go home. Not before. <laughs> Any luck here, Jim? Yes, Paul. Oh, where'd they go? They were sold two tickets on a bus for Boston. Ticket agent just gave you that? Yeah, the boys walked in, and Rico asked him for two tickets on the first bus that was going out. Hmm. I'm surprised he didn't call the police seeing two kids act like that. Oh, I checked that. He said the bus company was sued last year for aiding in a false arrest. Since then, he's been instructed not to do anything but sell tickets. Jim, is there any chance of stopping that bus before it gets to Boston? No, it arrived there a couple of hours ago. That's too bad. What are you going to do now? Call the Boston office and have them send out an alarm on the boys. I see. I've got to go up there tomorrow on another case. While I'm there, I'll see what I can do. Boston's a big city, Jim. Yeah, yeah, I know, Paul. But if they're still there, I've got an idea on how I might find them. Rico. Yeah, what is it? I don't feel so good. What's the matter? I wish I was home. Oh, quit beefing, will you? Well, what time did the doctor say he'd be? As soon as he could. I told him to hurry. Yeah. Rico. What? Take it easy when you slug him, will you? Why? Well, you can kill a guy hitting him over the head. Yeah, not this way. Well, I don't want to get mixed up in nothing where a guy gets killed. Will you shut up? But, Rico, I... All right, quiet. Wait till I get behind the door before you open it. Okay. I'm coming. Dr. Chancimino? No, I'm not Dr. Chancimino, Vinny. Huh? How do you know my name? Because I've been looking for you. For your friend, too. Come on out from behind the door, Rico. Okay, then I'll close it. Hey, what's the idea? Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. Huh? How did you know he was here? You were traced to Boston. I had a hunch you'd try the same thing here, so I had every doctor alerted. Told him to call our office if he got a phone call late at night from someone who wasn't a regular patient. Oh, you're real smart, ain't you? No, Rico. But I am smart enough to know that you two are headed in the wrong direction. Now you're going to come back home with me. Rico Anderson was sentenced to a reformatory to remain there until he is 21 years old. Because his companion, Vinnie Franklin, was greatly influenced in participating in the crime, he was paroled in the custody of his parents. And now we switch to Washington, D.C., in order that you may hear a vital message from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Hoover. Good citizens develop. So do criminals. Each is the product of training, opportunity, and surroundings. Both have one thing in common. 
Their early years foretell their future. Youth is a time to prepare for the full life in the future. Study, work, and recreation with the aid of a good home which earnestly seeks spiritual as well as mental and physical development of its children leads to good citizenship. These are the forces that create a feeling of personal responsibility and equip youth to face the future with confidence and courage. This nation's responsibility to its youth is increasing. It must because of the facts that are stark and revealing. The crime problem in this nation almost exceeds imagination as 190 major offenses occur somewhere in our country every hour, day and night. Its toll in monetary terms, if diverted, could retire our national debt in less than a generation. Add to that another great menace, the failure of citizenship. And we have a major domestic problem. The call of citizenship today has never before been so clear. Criminals who would rob us of our lives and property and godless communists who would rob us of liberty and freedom by their deception present a challenge that calls for action. I know of no better way to prepare for the future of America than to provide now for the future of our youth. The Boys Clubs of America have accepted this challenge. 300 boys clubs throughout the nation are providing wholesome recreation and constructive activities for boys who are learning and practicing self-reliance, tolerance, and fair play. America needs young people like these. It needs youthful viewpoints and youthful hopes. It needs boys who will bring vitality to the homes, the schools, the churches, and in short, to every arena of human endeavor. It needs future citizens who believe in God and who recognize the need for moral stability. It wants clean, healthy boys who are ready at all times to fight, if need be, for American principles. These ideals are the foundation of the spirit of the Boys Clubs of America. If this splendid organization is to expand and continue to help build the citizens of tomorrow, it merits the wholehearted support of serious-minded Americans today. Thank you, Mr. Hoover. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, a quick review of the special three-point service offered by your Equitable Society representative to help you get the most out of Social Security. First, it gives you a clear picture of what Social Security can accomplish for you. Second, your Equitable Society representative supplies you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration for checking up on your position under Social Security. Third, he shows you how easy and inexpensive it is to build Social Security into full security. Don't fail to take advantage of the special service offered without charge by your Equitable Representative and the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a factual account of the manipulations of a hardened hijacker. Its subject, theft from interstate shipment. Its title, The Easy Marksman. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Easy Marksman on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States 
and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight you have a chance to do one of your friends a real favor. If you know someone who needs an ideal home mortgage, why not phone him and tell him to listen to this program for an important message coming in about 14 minutes. The Equitable Society will give complete details on their assured home ownership plan. This famous Equitable plan is a money saver, a worry saver, a home saver, because it combines a low interest rate mortgage with special life insurance protection, all in one package. It's America's finest plan for home ownership, offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Lonesome Lamister. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI demonstrates that for the most part, criminals are primarily opportunists. Not many of them plan carefully to commit their first crime. That happens because circumstances present them with an opportunity for illegal gain. And either their weakness or their greed overpowers their sense of right and wrong, and they plunge into a criminal career. It does little good to attempt to impress upon those people the irrefutable fact that crime can never possibly be made to pay. Because even if they accept that fact, it would not prevent them from the commission of that first crime. When circumstances conspire to present them with that opportunity to gain something without earning it, they are so overcome by the temptation that they do not stop to think. They grab automatically... For in that moment when they make that decision, they adopt for themselves the motto of the criminal. The motto of every criminal throughout the world. To take first and ask questions later. Tonight's file opens in the dimly lit hallway of a walk-up tenement in a large Midwestern city. A man and woman are standing outside an apartment door. Well... Thanks for bringing me home, Mr. Snyder. Well, that's all right. I'd ask in, but the place is a mess. Oh. Well, I have some errands to do anyway. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. Yeah? Are, are you going to be busy later on? I don't know. Why? I thought... I don't want you to think I'm being fresh or anything. I thought maybe we could go to a movie. Swell. Well, then you'll go? Sure. Where do you want me to meet you? Well, will here be all right? Sure. I'll pick you up then in about an hour. Fine. See you later. All right. Sally. Oh, you're home, huh? Who's the guy? His name is Snyder. I mean, where'd he come from? He's a customer at the restaurant. He's got a pretty nice car. How do you know? They made you out the window. Oh, well. He dresses pretty good, too. I didn't notice. Throwing you... Little romance, is he? He's a lonesome guy. Now drop it. I went to Bentley's today during lunch. Saw a real nice dress. It was too much dough, but I went for it. Mm-hmm. I won't get it till tomorrow. I'm having it altered. Seems I'm having measurement trouble. They had to let it out about two you know, inches. Oh, there's of... something funny about him. About who? Your friend. Al, are you still? I'm trying to figure him out. Get his ankle. Look, why does there always have to be an angle with everybody? Because there always is. Oh. Now look, why would a guy with nice clothes and a good car eat at that hash house of yours? How do I know? You know what the bum must be? One of them suburban cheats. He'd probably get a nice home, nice little wife who don't understand him, and he comes to town once a week to let off steam. He told me he's single. Guys have been handing that line out since before silent pictures. Well, I believe him. Okay, all right, all right. You know, I heard him say he was going to pick you up in an hour. That's right. Where are you going? To the movies. Do you mind? No. In fact, I'm glad you're going. The 
Next morning at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is working on a file as Agent Vince Cameron approaches. Jim. Oh, yes, Vince. I came over to say goodbye for a couple of days. I'm off to the hospital. Why? What's wrong? I gotta have my tonsils out. Hey, it's too bad. I wish you were gonna be with me on this Stevens case. He was the teller at the National Security Bank who disappeared suddenly last May. Oh, I wasn't with this office then. Oh? Well, the story is, when the bank examiners came in to check the books, they found that Stevens was $62,000 short. He got quite a bit of publicity. I imagine. And as I say, he just disappeared, but completely. How come we're suddenly getting active on the case again? There's been a new development. Mr. Woods at the bank called and said he had some information about Stevens. I see. It seems that a depositor is a friend who took a cruise to South America some six months ago... He showed some movies that he took on the trip. Oh? And the depositor recognized a man who was standing in the background. It was Stevens. So he called Mr. Woods at the bank, and he definitely identified Stevens. That was six months ago, Jim. He could have covered a lot of territory in that time. Maybe he has, Vince, but at least we're six months closer to him. Have you spoken to the man with the pictures yet? I'm going over to meet him now. Hey, when do you do at the hospital? In an hour. Well, I'll take care of the legwork on the Stevens case. You just worry about taking care of yourself. What is it, hon? How do you like it? Like what? My new dress. Oh, oh. Looks okay. Well, thanks. How'd you uh, like the movie last night, huh? Not bad. Hey, did you like that part about the fight in the mountain cabin? Yeah, I thought... Have you seen the picture? Uh Uh-huh. When? Last night. Huh? I was sitting right behind you. Oh, now, look. I wanted to follow your friend, find out where he lives. Al, I wish you'd... He lives alone at the Kenmore Apartments. I went back to the place this morning. He was out, so I let myself in. To his apartment? Uh Uh-huh. I get a pass key. Al, why? Told you I wanted to find out about him. I cased the whole joint. All I could find was a social security card and a driver's license. You know, there's something phony about that guy. What do you mean? Well, according to the license and the Social Security, his name ain't Snyder. They were made out in the name of Harold Stevens in Cleveland. Maybe they belong to a friend. Uh-uh. The description on the driver's license fits him too good. Well, what do you make of it, then? I think that guy is a Lannister. Oh, that timid little character? Uh, I'm going to find out. How? Got me a friend in Cleveland. I'm writing him a letter. I'll just ask him to dig around on anybody named Harold Stevens. Hi, Jim. Hey, Vince. Good to see you. Thanks. How come they let you out of the hospital so soon? I was too healthy. Well, you look fine. I feel good. Well, what's new in the Stevens case? Plenty. I went over and looked at those movies and interviewed the man who owned them, a man named Baker. Did he remember Stevens from the trip? Yes, he said he'd gotten quite friendly with him. Fine. Stevens boarded the boat in Rio and went all the way to New Orleans. He said he was going to stay there for a couple of weeks and invited Baker to have dinner with him. I don't know of a better place to get a dinner invitation. Yes, but Baker wasn't sticking around New Orleans that long, so he had to pass it up. I wired the New Orleans office, asked them to check the hotels and see if they could get any lead on Stevens. Any luck? Yes, they found he'd registered at one of the hotels... But he stayed two weeks and left. Any forwarding address? Yes, a whole series of them. Here's the list. From New Orleans, he went to San Antonio, San Antonio to the Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon to Los Angeles. Really seeing the world. From Los Angeles to San Francisco, San Francisco to Yellowstone Park, Yellowstone Park to Bay City. He couldn't have gone to any more places if he joined the Navy. No. (laughs) Well, the trail ends at Bay City, and it looks like a dead end. How come? He checked out of the hotel on Bay City, and at that place, he left no forwarding address. I see. He used several different names on the journey, but they weren't too difficult to trace because every one of them were with his real initials. Have the Bay City police been notified? Yeah, they're making a check on him now. You know, Vince, I've got an idea he's still up there. Why? Every place that he did leave, he left a forwarding address. Now, he had the transportation desk get his tickets, too. In Bay City, he just checked out. No forwarding address, no tickets, no nothing. Vince, tell me, do you feel well enough to do some traveling? Sure. Then let's take a trip to Bay City. Baby, we got our answer. Answer? From what? The guy I wrote to in Cleveland about your friend Snyder. Oh. You know what? Mr. Snyder, or to use his real name, Mr. Stevens, clipped a bank for 62 beautiful G's. 
Oh, I don't believe it. Oh, that. honey, honey. I talked to my boy on the phone. Told me the whole story. Well, what do you know? Ah. Wonder what made him do it. 62 G's. Look, baby, what do we care what made him do it? We know he's the guy. That's all that counts. Al, if he stole $62,000 from a bank, he's too big for us. No, well, not if he's got any of that dough left, he ain't. Well, you just can't go in and, and stick him up. Uh-uh. I don't figure on doing it that way. Well, what are you going to do? You just get him up here. I'll show you. Oh, baby, baby, this is the big one. Let's hook him while we got the chance. <laughs> Mr. Snyder. Hello, Sally. Come on in. Thanks. I, uh, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine. Oh, I didn't mean to break in while you had company. That's all right. Mr. Snyder, this is Mr. Adams. It's very nice to meet you. Ah, same here. I'm sorry to be late, Sally. I'd have been here sooner, but there was such a crowd at the station. What station? Uh, The railroad station. I went down to check my bags. You going someplace? Yes, I wanted to come by here before I left. I'd have come down even if you hadn't called me. You see, I I wanted to thank you. Thank me? For what? For being being such pleasant company. For being nice to me like you have. Uh, where are you going, Mr. Snyder? Well, I'm... I'm going east. Oh, and I guess we better get right down to business, huh? What do you mean? Well... (laughs) I'd done something a few days ago which wasn't exactly ethical, Mr. Snyder. I busted into your apartment. What? You don't leave much around for a guy to look at, but I did find a social security card and a driver's license. They were made out to a Harold Stevens. Look, mister, you had no right... Let me finish, huh? The description on the license fits you real good. The hometown on it was Cleveland, so I wrote to a friend of mine there. I don't want to hear any more about this. Just stay put, brother, I... Heard from my friend in Cleveland today. Now I know why you changed your name. That's quite a job you did. 62 thou is a real good score. Mr. Snyder, are you really that guy? Yes, sir. Well, that saves us time. Mr. Snyder, we got a deal all figured out, do you? What are you talking about? Well, we think you're a nice guy, so we ain't gonna blow a whistle. All you gotta do is cut us in. I don't understand. Give us a piece of the 62 G's and we say nothing to the cops. I'm afraid you're too late with that, Mr. Adams. What? I've already decided to give myself up to the police. What? I'm on my way back to Cleveland now. You must be off your rocker. No, no. But I was when I stole the money. I've been miserable ever since, knowing that they were looking for me, afraid of every stranger, every knock on the door. You're really going to turn yourself in? Yes. I've got $40,000 left. I'm going to give that much back to them and ask for mercy. So, you see, Mr. Adams, whatever your idea was, it won't work. Sit down. What? I said sit down. You got 40 J's, mister. You ain't going no place. We'll return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI protects American citizens and American homes. Now a word about another type of home protection. Protection to make sure that some sad day you won't have to turn to your wife and say, It's no use, dear. I can't borrow another cent. All those doctor and hospital bills last winter and then losing my job this spring. Now they're going to foreclose the mortgage. We're going to lose our home. When a man has worked and saved for a home of his own, it's pretty hard to lose it. And that's why the Equitable Society created its Assured Home Ownership Plan. This money-saving, home-saving plan combines a low-cost first mortgage with life insurance to give you twofold protection against the two greatest dangers in home mortgages. The first danger is hard time. In the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, a special cash fund is built up during the owner's lifetime. It's always ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. As the mortgage shrinks, this cash fund increases. For example, it can be used to pay off a 20-year mortgage in approximately 15 years. The second hazard in home mortgages 
is the death of the breadwinner. In the assured home ownership plan, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage if the owner dies. It's paid off in full. And what's more, every dollar previously paid under the plan to reduce the principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Last but not least, the mortgage interest is only 4%. And there's a liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. So, all in all, a man is very fortunate if his health, age, income, his home, and his location qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. To find out if you qualify, get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Lonesome Lannister. The world is a large planet. According to the best available figures, it consists of more than 51 million square miles and is inhabited by more than 2 billion people. But with all of that, it can still be very small when you are the object of an intensive manhunt. Nowhere is there an island of utter safety for you. Nowhere are you absolutely free of the fear that the next person you meet will not be the one to recognize you, nor even that the next knock on the door will not be the police who have at long last caught up with you. Living under those conditions, there is constant terror. Sleep becomes a terrible memory. You stay awake night after night, planning your next move, planning which retreat to use until, finally, you weary of the constant pressure. You weary because you are sure of one thing. You are not sleeping. And you know there are others who are not sleeping. Others who are searching for you. Others like your FBI. Tonight's file continues at police headquarters in Bay City. Well, Vince, I went by the Central Hotel. That's the place Stephen stayed when he first got to Bay City. Anybody there remember him? No, but we checked back through the reservations. His name was there. Well, that doesn't tell us anything we didn't know before. Except that I learned that he checked out at 322. How does that help, Jim? Well, I figured there was a chance he might have taken a taxi from in front of the hotel because he did have some baggage with him. I see. Now, this box here is full of taxi trip records. Every cab ride that was taken on the afternoon of the 7th is in this box. We've got to go through every one of them? Well, that's already been done. I... Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Yes. You have? That's fine. Just a moment, please. Okay, go ahead. 814 West Jefferson Street. I've got it. Yes, thanks very much, Captain. Vince, that was Captain Lane up at the 2nd Precinct. A taxi trip record led one of his men to Stevens' apartment. Let's get a search warrant and get up there. I'm going to ask you once more, where is the money? I can't tell you. You want me to go to work on you again? Oh, let me try. Mr. Snyder, or whatever your name is, please tell him where you got the money. I can't, Sally. It's the bank's money, and I'm going to return it to them. Your friend here can hit me all Wait a minute, wait a minute. I got an idea. What is it? Look, he told us he checked his bags. He's probably got the dough in one of those bags. Yeah. Well, Frisk, I'm stand up, you. No, I said stand leave up. me alone. Holly, you have no right to see what we easy, Mister. Leave me alone. Wait a minute. Here they are. Look, there's two claim checks. Sally, take these and get those bags. Go ahead, Vince. Thanks. Well, this is the closest we've been to Stevens. This place looks like it's been cleaned out, Jim. Yeah, the superintendent said it was bare. Any point now looking around? I want to examine that wastebasket. Super said it was full of torn letters, all kinds of papers. Huh? I wonder what made Stevens leave. No telling. I doubt that he could have known we were closing in. No. Hey, Vince. What? Hey, look at this. 
Is it from the basket? Yeah, it's part of a letter. Look at what's written on this piece here. W-O-O, and then here on this one, D-S. Woods. Mm Mm-hmm. Isn't that the president of that bank? That's right. Vince, will you take Stephen's picture down to the railroad station? Sure. See if anybody can recognize him. All right, where will I meet you? Back at headquarters. I haven't worked on a jigsaw puzzle in years, but I'm going to try to piece this letter together. It might help us. That you, Sally? Yeah. Thought you were never coming back. These things are heavy. Take them, will you? All right, all right. Come on, Hmm. clear that table off with you, honey. I'll throw this one right up there. All right. Oh, you tied him up, huh? Yeah. Well, the bag's locked. Yeah, let me try this key he had in his pocket. Hey. Al. Look at all that green stuff. Oh, baby. It's all ours. Hey, what happens to him now? What do you mean? Well, he'll go to the cops as soon as we let him free. We ought to blow him. No, no. Oh, we can't just sit here. Honey, make a little deal that'll square everything. How'd you make out at the railroad station, Vince? Nobody recognized the picture, but that doesn't make any difference now. Oh, why not? Stevens is in a cell down the hall. He's what? He was brought in about 15 minutes ago by a young girl and her boyfriend. The girl works in a restaurant as a cashier, and Stevens came in for dinner. She recognized him from a picture in a detective magazine. One of those wanted pictures? Yes. Mm-hmm. Said she called her boyfriend because she was afraid she wouldn't be able to handle Stevens alone. Vince, have you seen Stevens? Yes, I went down and had a talk with him. He's got a story. Oh, what kind? He stated that this young couple stole $40,000 from him. He also claimed he was about to make partial restitution when they took the money. I see. Oh, I couldn't piece those bits of that letter together, so I sent them over to the lab. We shouldn't need them now, Jim. Well, I'll see what the report is on it anyway. Vince, I think I'll go down and talk to Stevens. Soda, honey? Yeah. Yeah? You know... I'm going to call that hash house tomorrow. Tell him I quit. <laughs> I'm going to call that hash house tomorrow. Tell him I quit. <laughs> I'm going to stay in bed till noon. Oh, I swear. When do we collect the reward? Well, pretty soon, I think. <laughs> what a head for larceny. I never would have thought of it. You're a girl. You're not supposed to have brains. <laughs> you say the nicest thing. Who that? Don't know. Should I answer it? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, coming. Miss Sherman? That's right. Who is it, baby? I'm finding out. I'm a special agent of the FBI, Miss Sherman. Oh? Here are my credentials. Uh, He's from the FBI, Al. All right, bring him in. Uh, Come in. Thank you. Well, hey, suppose you come to ask me some more questions about that guy Stevens, huh? Yes, yes, I have. Well, there was no hero stuff in the deal. As soon as I see who he was, I know there's only one thing to do. Call the cops. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Yes? What happens with the reward? When do we get it? Well, I have sort of a presentation to make to you both right now. Oh? These warrants are for your arrest. What is this? I had a talk with Mr. Stevens. He said he was about to surrender voluntarily and return $40,000 out of that money that he'd stolen. He's a liar. I don't think so. You see, we found some torn pieces of paper in the wastebasket in his apartment. They proved to us he was telling the truth. Look, Mr. Taylor. The laboratory pieced them together. They proved to be a letter that Stevens wrote to the bank he used to work for. It said that he was returning to Cleveland and was bringing back $40,000. He didn't have a dime on him when we caught him. That's the truth. I'd save that story for a judge if I were you. And I'd make up another one, too. What do you mean? To explain what those two bags are doing in that corner over there with the initials H.S. on them. I (gasps) believe they belong to Stevens. We brought them here before we took them to the police station. I believe that. I also believe you took his money. But now, wait. before we go, are you going to give me that money, or do I have to look around and find it myself? Herbert Snyder was sentenced to ten years for bank embezzlement. 
Al Adams and his girlfriend, Sally, also received 10-year sentences for receiving stolen property. And thus, once more, did the laboratory of your FBI furnish the proof which was needed by a special agent in order to close a case successfully. The lab, as it is called, does not perform dramatic miracles, but it does do a thorough, impartial job of helping to investigate crime scientifically. Sixteen years ago, the Federal Bureau of Investigation Laboratory started with one man and one microscope. Today, there are 300 trained scientists at work examining evidence of crimes committed in every state. Last year, more than 100,000 such pieces were examined. And in every instance, the lab was not looking for evidence to convict. It was looking for the result of a scientific investigation. And science knows no master. It will prove innocence as well as guilt. And for that reason, the laboratory of your FBI functions the way every other branch of the Bureau does. As an impartial protector of you, the citizens of America. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Friends, if you were impressed a few minutes ago by what I told you about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the idea appeals to you of a low interest rate first mortgage combined with life insurance to protect your home against death and hard times, then I suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable representative soon. He'll show you exactly what this plan will do for you personally, how much money it can save you, how much added security it will give you. So contact your Equitable Society representative without delay or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The case that describes the calloused operations of a hired assassin. Its subject, parole violation. Its title... The big guy. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The big guy on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.